The Melbourne International Film Festival ended two calendar months ago, but I am only doing a video about it now. I don't know. I'm, I'm like this. <laughs> this is what I'm like. Try as I might, I simply cannot be topical. See, it's October. I wanted to do a Halloween video, but I didn't. <laughs> Probably do a Halloween video in like January or something. So I'm still in this kind of phase of like experimenting with what I want my channel to be. Like I want to do these more like more in depth, more research videos that I have in my drafts folder. But I also want to have these like more loosey goosey chill vibes. I want to have the space for those. I put, I really put a lot of pressure on myself to just like have my videos be put together in a way like Yes, even when I'm doing really weird ones about early 2000s TV movies. <laughs> so MIF was weird this year. It was one of those events that had to be like re-cancelled. You know how 2020 was full of events that were either cancelled outright due to the plague or put online due to the plague. Um, and then this year was all about events that were like, woo, we're doing things in person again. We can go to the cinema. Whoops. Delta variant. I was devastated that I didn't manage to book any of the in-person events when there were like actually tickets available for those. Cause like, I just, I just logged on too late and they sold out way too fast. They sent out an email that was like, what up? Titan won some, won a palm door. So we're adding screenings come watch Titan. Uh, and I clicked that link about 45 minutes after I received the email and all of the sessions were completely sold out. And then I think they start, tried doing just like a half, like half capacity sessions, but like we were well and truly locked down at that point. And then it just went 100% online, except for the ones that they couldn't get the rights to. So like, I'm really disappointed that I didn't get to see like Sensor or In the Earth or Titan for that matter. Uh, they just didn't have the online rights, I guess. Cool. So here's all the movies that I watched in the order that I watched them because I don't know what other order to organize them into. All right, so I kicked things off with Witches of the Orient. I like sports documentaries. <laughs> I don't like sports. I don't like sports movies, but I love a good sports documentary. Especially if it's like a weird sport or a team that's doing something strange. Ooh! A few myths ago my favourite sports documentary was Girl Unbound about Pakistan's number one women's squash player. Um, that was, uh, yeah, that was a really great documentary. Um, I very much recommend it, especially if you want to hear an elderly Pakistani man tell a Taliban enforcer to fuck off. <laughs> uh, anyway, Witches of the Orient. Similar vibes, much lower stakes. <laughs> Um, this movie was about the Japanese Olympic women's volleyball team uh, leading up to their win at the 1964 Olympics. Um, I liked it. I liked watching it. <laughs> That's, I'm not a reviewer. Uh, I think this documentary did a really good job of balancing like the actual lives of the women on the team with the public perception of them. Um, like, there's this really interesting scene where it was archival footage of a volleyball match intercut with scenes of that volleyball match recreated in an anime that was, like, made at the time. And the soundtrack was really good. Uh, yeah, good soundtrack. Um, this movie walks a very fine line of making the team's struggle seem realistic even when they were undefeated for something like 260 games. Um, I think they, this documentary also did a really great job of showing that like, these women are athletes at the top of their game, representing their country in a sport at the Olympics, but also like, it's, it's kind of just their job. <laughs> like, like, yeah, it's their job. It, the, the reason they were a team was it was an after hours activity at the textile factory they all worked at. Ah, Sisters with Transistors is a very important history, but the documentary is a list of names. <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's, they bit off more than they can chew with this one. Um, it kind of reminds me of like the, the ABC documentary Brazen Hussies, uh, which 
had one hour to tell the entire history of feminism in Australia. And I'm like, of course you're not going to do a good job of that. It's going to start great, and then you're going to realize 20 minutes in, oh, this is just a list. Now I'm tired. Um, Sisters with Transistors was 90 minutes long, and I was exhausted by the end of it. And like, it's such an important and interesting history. It's just not a good documentary. <laughs> what? Uh, I should tell you what it's about. It's about the history of women in electronic music. Fascinating, right? Fascinating. What it doesn't do well is provide a whole lot of context. Like, there is a direct line between the way the first method of, like, visually creating, like visually interfacing with the machine that makes the music and how music is visualized today. There is a direct line between that, but you wouldn't know it watching this movie. You just kind of watch a woman draw squiggles on some cellophane and then your partner says, oh, you know, you could draw a direct line between that and how di music is digitally imaged today. And then you go, Huh, you could. And then the documentary moves right on to Forbidden Planet. <laughs> and this documentary started really strong with like, what was post-war Britain like? So like Britain in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and like it followed these women who were working at the BBC um, who were like really gifted mathematically as well as musically. It's like, what are they doing with these machines that make tones? Um, and then it kind of jumped straight to the soundtrack of Forbidden Planet and how, like, it couldn't be listed as music in the, like, on the poster. And it's like, oh, that's really interesting because they did a whole ass film soundtrack, but it wasn't, um, they didn't get to be listed as composers. Uh, and then they kind of jumped back to Britain where the Doctor Who theme gave a little bit of credence to like electronic music uh, and then it just moves on to something else and it's like mm, just all of that context just vanishes after this um, and like any topic that was brought up could be a whole documentary in itself like you could do a whole documentary on the women in the sound department of the BBC um, from 1945 to 1965. That could be a full 90 minute documentary. But it wasn't. Um, Wendy Carlos deserved better. She got like 30 seconds of screen time and she was gendered correctly all of the time. Um, but basically they went from 30 seconds of her album and then uh, Suzanne Ciani brought up a beef that they had and got to talk about her life for like 10, probably not 10 more minutes, like five minutes. Uh, Wendy Carlos's album, Switched on Bark, which was released under her old name, um, and her life is fascinating, but you know, you wouldn't know from this documentary. So that album, <sighs> Switched on Bark was like, you got just a, just a little, a waft of context in that it was loved popularly. It did quite well sales-wise, but it was hated by classical music types and by electronic music types. And it's like, oh, oh, context. Oh, it's gone. Hmm. Hmm. You know, you could have a whole thing about how, like, what Wendy Carlos was doing with Switched on Bach was, like, really interesting and transgressive, and how uh, living as a transgender woman in the 60s and 70s was also very interesting and transgressive, but they don't do that. Um, and Wendy Carlos is still alive, I would very much like to know why she wasn't interviewed and why she doesn't appear on the uh, documentary's official website. <laughs> I feel weird talking so much about a documentary that over on the whole I didn't dislike, I just think needed some serious structural edits. Every now and then you'd get like a little, someone would say something about how little respect these women were receiving both as electronic musicians and as women. Um, but you actually don't feel that at all in the documentary. It just seems like they're having a terrific time. 
living their best lives, making bleep bloops out of machinery. What was the public reception? What was the critical reception? What was the rest of music like at the time? Did any of these women meet? Did they like each other? Did they like each other's music? And I compared it to Brazen Hussies earlier, but Brazen Hussies did a good job of like demonstrating what Australian culture was like and why feminism was such an uphill battle. But this movie just like, hmm, here's some women. Overall, it, I think that this, it's a, it's a good thing that this documentary exists and it's not the worst thing in the world that it's just a list of women. Um, it's just that lists are boring if they go on for too long. And that's why I'm trying to keep this video as short as possible. Come back anytime on the other hand, that's how you make a documentary. Um, every time I've had to do a research project, the advice I've gotten is like, you need to make your research questions small. You've got to shave it right down, shave it, narrow that focus. Cause like the narrower the focus is, the more you can write about just your thing, about the thing you want to write about. You don't have to like give a, just like a really half-hearted whole history. <laughs> so like, whereas Sisters with Transistors was the entire history a very dense subject, Come Back Anytime, is one guy who runs one restaurant and his regular customers and how much they love it. And it's just really sweet. <laughs> it's just a nice story about a dude who runs a business that people love and in some cases people have been going back to for like 30 years. There, there are couples who met at this ramen shop and have children now. It, it rules. And there's a lot of like incidental like history and like food philosophy and stuff, but um, ultimately it's just a nice story about some people who like a restaurant. <laughs> I feel kind of weird saying so little about Come Back Anytime when I said so much about Sisters with Transistors. Um, because like, but like, I don't know. I just, Come Back Anytime gave me such like nice, warm, safe feelings. It was just like, ah, oh, what a what a nice thing that is happening. I was like watching it quite late at night too, so I'm like, hmm. hmm. <sighs> Didn't help that I was locked down to all hell and really wanted to go to a ramen shop. Maybe I can do it again. Yeah, Psychomania, weird 70s movie. It was supposed to be a double feature with uh, Lair of the White Worm, which I have seen and would recommend. Um, but Delta Variant. It's one of those movies that's kind of like, youth culture is strange and adults don't understand it. Ooh, zombies. You can only die once. After that, nothing and nobody can harm you. Oh man, what are you waiting for? But yeah, yeah, it was fun. Fun movie. Um, I, I don't want to like, I think I could do like a whole video just about it and its history, but like that would require so much more research than I've done. I, it, it's well established by this point that I like when movies get weird with it, and this movie gets weird with it. 10 points. <laughs> North by Current had all of the elements of a very sleazy true crime podcast, so I really appreciate that it was not that. So instead of being a sleazy true crime podcast, the whole case of like um, a family tragedy and a wrongful conviction and then that conviction being overturned and then that leading to a bunch of other convictions for other people being overturned. That was just like act one of quite a thoughtful personal story. So this film uses that case to come to like a sort of messy, not quite conclusion about the nature of things like love and family and justice and grief. And it's much messier than the, the true crime format can really, can really handle. It's less about the ins and outs of the case as much as it is about the director coming to terms with his, uh, his relationship to his family in the wake of a tragedy um, and him coming back to his hometown and his family accepting their trans son. Um, I just really appreciate everything this movie wasn't. It wasn't a sleazy true crime podcast. It wasn't a voyeuristic, like, ooh, Aunt Mormon's creepy kind of documentary. Um, it was just, uh, it was pretty self-indulgent, but it did also leave room to, like, criticize the director for his behavior. A lot of, uh, I, had, I had feelings about it. <laughs> I had a lot of feelings. The writer-director of Azor is the son of a Swiss banker 
and his contempt for the industry really shows. <laughs> this movie is like a slow burn with an incredible payoff. Uh, my partner and I were kind of like, kind of falling asleep watching it, um, but like at the end we're just like sitting up glued to the screen like holy shit that's what was happening? So this movie follows Ivan who is a private banker uh, for a Swiss bank and he is trying to both track down his missing business partner and tie off and finalize all of the contracts that he was working on. And this is all happening in Argentina at the end, sort of the tail end of Pinochet. Hey everyone, just gonna swoop in with a little correction. It has been pointed out to me that I got my South American military dictatorships mixed up. Augusto Pinochet ran a military dictatorship in Chile. This movie is set in Argentina. I am so sorry. On with the video. Thank you. So the slowness of this movie really works in favour of building what uh, just the atmosphere of Argentina in the 1980s. Uh, they explain in the third act that the word Azor is like Swiss banker slang, meaning keep quiet, effectively. And this is a movie that really takes its time showing you what it means when people keep quiet. It is very low key. It's very low key in how it portrays a military dictatorship. Like all of the horrors are happening like just off screen, just out of frame. So the plot involves mostly like rich people doing rich people things, but the more it goes on, the more you realize that it's, these are the people who are left over. People are being disappeared left, right and center. And these people kept quiet, and that's why they're here. <laughs> this film, just like the characters, talk about a military dictatorship by not talking about it, because talking about it gets you disappeared. There are so many glaring absences. Like there's this one family who um, Ivan talks to, and their adult daughter was a political activist who disappeared several years ago under suspicious circumstances. And so many sounds. And just her absence is such a presence in every dealing with that family. And similarly, the whole plot is a guy looking for a missing business partner and you can feel him in every scene, but he's not there. The, the whole film feels like you're looking in one direction you're looking over here, and right behind you, something horrible is happening. Something absolutely dreadful is happening over here, but you keep looking here. You keep looking this way, and you keep smiling, and you pretend that you can't. You don't know what that is, because if you look at it, you have to understand it, and if you understand it, you have to make the choice between doing something and putting yourself in danger, or doing nothing and living with that. Uh, speaking of keys, the whole plot is just Ivan trying to like tidy up after him and like there's just a bunch of clients who Keyes was working with but then he vanished before he could finalize those deals and like you get the idea that Keyes it was the salesman, he was the social guy, he was the guy who would organize everything and then Ivan would do everything behind the scenes. Um, so then like now Ivan has to do Keyes' job and figure out what happened to Keyes, and he's not equipped to do either of those. So like, the whole plot is just this guy's, he has every shred of confidence and self-worth just removed from him as the plot goes on, and this builds up to like, that ending that is just like, <laughs> Just a funny little shit. I scrolled through some reviews on Letterboxd and it really seems like this is a film that will either land for you or not. Um, like I said, it really landed for me. Um, I've said it's, you know, it's a slow burn and now you have all of this context and maybe that will help it land for you, but it also might not. Like I said, it's a slow movie where things are said by not saying them. <laughs> no Ordinary Man. Oh, now my window's shaking. Why is this room so loud? <laughs> is this why I don't get anything done? No Ordinary Man is a documentary about Billy Tipton, who is a jazz musician who was very successful and then after his death was revealed to be trans. Something that really struck me about 
Billy Tipton was that every photo of him, he is smiling. And not like smiling, posing for a camera, smiling. Like, I mean really smiling. Like, dude is thrilled to be here. He just, he loves his job. He loves that he gets to be a man. Dude's living his best life. So the documentary is less about Tipton himself and more about like his legacy to trans masculine people today. There's a really touching moment. There's a really, really touching moment where the director is talking to Billy Tipton's son, Billy Tipton Jr. And um, the director brings up that he's trans and Tipton Jr.'s like whole demeanor completely changes because like this is a guy who has spent his whole life being interviewed about his father and mm, they show some of these interviews and like, ooh, they are rough. Like he's being interviewed by people who at best view his father as like a medical oddity, like the very best you can hope for. And now he is being interviewed by someone who thought his father was a hero. And it's just watching him realize that is, it, it's really touching. So like, this is a guy who like at one point viewed his father as a hero and then grew up and realized his father was kind of just a regular dude um, and is now realizing actually his father was a hero. <laughs> um, and that's just so sweet and touching. Um, Wolf Children, adorable. I loved it. Very, very nice, a very sweet animation. I don't want to compare it to a Ghibli movie um, because like it's it's a Japanese animated movie so it's going to be compared to a Miyazaki um, but like similar kind of nice feeling about it. Um, it's also just like a real testament to parents who get shit done like whoops my kids are wolves gotta move up a mountain and subsistence farm because that's the only way this is gonna work. And it's really beautiful to look at. It's got some really lovely animation. Love Veronica lures you into thinking that it's like a, that its message is just gonna be, hmm, maybe we should be seeking validations in places that aren't social media. Uh, and then it just gets darker and darker and darker. Whew. The whole film is done with this just like really interesting technical setup where the main character's face is in the center of the frame. For the whole thing. That's really neat from a formal perspective and it also like brings you into how she wants her world to be and it like forces you to like maintain empathy with her for the whole thing and that empathy that you're forced to maintain starts to feel real icky because she just does worse and worse things as the film goes on and my god it's fascinating to watch. Massive content warning for infant death, by the way, just just in case. So <laughs> this film, like, in a really interesting way, gives its game away quite early. So there's a scene where Veronica's being interviewed by a woman who's going to be writing her biography. And the interviewer is talking about, like, her life and her family and her daughter. And, like, she asks, does, she asks Veronica, do you have anything that's just for you? And she answers, everything's for me. And viewed in that context, it looks like in an interviewer trying to ask her a question, trying to prod some honesty out of her, but her just like deflecting the question and saying, nope, everything, I am 100% dedicated to my family. It's all about my family. But as it goes on, you realize, actually, no, everything's for her. Everything is for Veronica. Um, the She doesn't do anything unless it makes her look good and the people around her are either useful or they are discarded. There's also like a subplot where Veronica does this like very condescending charity photo shoot for a charity that does like a charity raising awareness for people with facial differences. And like the portrayal is definitely like she's doing this worthy cause to boost her own public profile. And it's definitely like sending her up for that. Um, it's like she's doing it to boost her public profile and it is a worthy cause, but she's just doing it so that like she can feel like a hero and everyone else involved is just doing it to feel important. Oh yes, look at me raising awareness. 
thank me later. <laughs> so information on the cast of this movie has been pretty hard to find, and I would be really interested to know if the actress they got to play the girl with the facial difference in the photo shoot, um, if that was like if she had a real facial difference or if it was makeup, because if it was makeup that undercuts the message a bit. Um, but not knowing that extra textual information, this like this works as a plot point. This girl is not someone Veronica sees as like a person really all that worthy of like dignity and respect. She is just someone who it's like she is in Veronica's orbit for exactly as long as she's useful to her, and then we never see her again. This is probably going to get a lot of comparisons to Ingrid Goes West, um, whereas while that movie was more about, hey, maybe if we've got these voids in our life, they can't really be filled with like the love of strangers on social media, La Veronica is going to be, it's more like, hey, people who don't care about what other people have going on have never had more outlets for their narcissism. Also, just a lot of great stylistic touches. It's very colourful, it's very bright, which I really like. Um, and like I mentioned before, the thing of like having the actor's face right in the centre, um, and the whole, uh, the end credits are just structured to look like an Instagram live stream. It's really cute. Um, Wife of a Spy visually absolutely beautiful. It was a very nice looking period drama. A uh, period drama set in Japan, which uh, I don't see a lot of. That says more about me than about anything else. I once watched this movie that was made um, just after World War II in Japan, and it was while Japan was kind of modernizing, so like half the people were dressed in like western style clothing and half the people were in kimonos. And like Wife of a Spy set in kind of this time, and it looked exactly like that, which I thought was really neat. One of the screenwriters was Ryusuke Hamaguchi, who also wrote and directed Asako 1 and 2, which I saw a few myths ago when we were allowed in cinemas and I really enjoyed. Wife of a Spy follows a housewife in the early years of World War II who finds out that her husband has been sending information to the Allied forces, and it's all about like, what do you do when what you want for your country and what your conscience is telling you are two different things. So this is a character who wants Japan to win the war, because that would be good for Japan, but she is just deeply disturbed by the information her husband is uncovering. I'm always a little suspicious of films that are like, it's a good guy surrounded by bad guys, what do they do? But this movie I think did a really good job of not like both sides in it or anything. These characters aren't necessarily treated as heroic, they're just kind of people who are doing the right thing in circumstances that make the right thing incredibly hard to do. And it's an interesting one to compare with Azor, because Azor was full of characters who didn't necessarily actively do the wrong thing, but when faced with a choice they chose to do nothing instead of doing something which would have been difficult. So Devotion was a documentary about Ogawa Productions, which was um, kind of a, a weird production house that was also kind of a cult. <laughs> a little bit walked of cult. Um, like they all lived in the middle of nowhere and the, the director, like the head of this production house, talked a big game about like the benefits of anonymity. We're all doing this anonymously and the film it just, the film speaks for itself, but his name was on it. <laughs> so I'm like, sure Jan, real anonymous. So I'm watching this documentary all about this production house that's like very weird, very idi idiosyncratic, doing like, they're very different to like how Japanese society was at the time, and they're doing like different things to what the film industry is doing at the time. I'm going, wow, this is really interesting, but it feels culty feels like a cult. And then one of the interview subjects was like, yeah, it was not dissimilar to a cult. <laughs> I'm like, there it is. <laughs> I don't know, neat piece of history. Uh, I, I like Japanese films and I like documentaries about interesting aspects of filmmaking. And this was just two of my interests mooshed together. The last film that I watched was Freak Scene. Uh, and I seem to be really good at uh, ending film festivals on films that are just kind of nice. Like, ah, oh, nice. This was, this was nice. I'm having a nice time and we're ending it here and I'm glad. 
Dinosaur Jr. is one of those bands that like I've always been kind of aware of and like I've always sort of liked their music but I've never really looked into it that much and like every band I like seems to be influenced by them um, so it was just cool to see their history. Like I have kind of a fondness for uncharismatic interview subjects. <laughs> Like, if the editing is right, it can be very endearing and kind of sweet. Um, but my god, Dinosaur Jr. is three guys who could not emote less if they tried. <laughs> what an interesting note to end on. That's what happens when I discuss these films in order instead of by, like, theme or whatever. That's everything I watched at MIFF. If you MIFFed this year, let me know in the comments what you saw and what you thought of it. What did you think of these films if you MIFFed them? <laughs> Go ahead and like and subscribe, etc. I have a Patreon where you can uh, set up a regular donation. I also have a PayPal where you can just give me a once-off donation. My credits are slightly less funny because one more name has been added to them. <laughs>